Okay, so our text today is going to be in 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 11. I'm calling this focus a, a simple test. I don't know if it's the best title, but we'll get into some of that in a bit. This obligatory titling of things, I don't know. Maybe it's, maybe it's not for me, but we'll try it a few more times. Before we get into our focus text for today, I want to look backward at the parts of the letter of 1 John that John has been speaking about the last two weeks. So just quickly reviewing chapters 1, verse 1, through chapter 2, verse 2, where we've been. Remember that the writer of this letter is John the Elder. He's writing to believers who he seems to have had a former relationship with as a mentor or a teacher or at least a part of their fellowship. And there's some concern about false teachers, false ideas, people who have left the community. And of course, if we put ourselves in the position of this happening in our fellowship, if someone were to start teaching other ideas that did not jive with what we know to be true or what we believed to be true, of course, this would cause us a lot of discomfort. Are we wrong? Are they wrong? What are we missing? Have we got the foundation mispoured? So that's going to be a big focus of what John is doing in this letter. Also in, these, in this first chapter, John asserts the profound and mysterious identity of Christ. This is one of the coolest parts, I think, of the letter. Just a couple of phrases that he uses to describe Christ. He is from the beginning. He is the word of life. Of course, this is very reminiscent of the gospel of John as well. He is the eternal life, which was with the father. This is an interesting idea that I think we're going to see play out a few more times throughout this letter. There's this kind of eclipsing of two ideas that it's easy for us to think of as separate. And John, in his unique approach, sort of eclipses these two ideas into one. I am used to thinking of the Word of God as this printed text, and it is, but also... John reminds us that Jesus himself is the word of God, and those two things eclipse. I think of eternal life as this thing that will happen later after I die, and it's going to be awesome. And I, then I think of Jesus as this other thing. But again, we have these two ideas eclipse. John says he is the eternal life. That's an interesting idea that we could spend a lot of time thinking about in what ways do we think of Jesus himself, knowing Jesus, being in Christ as eternal life right now. That's not the focus of our message, but it's pretty cool. He has appeared to us. So here he kind of shifts. He has appeared to us, John says. We have heard seen with our eyes, looked at, and touched. And again, I think the idea is not just in some kind of trance-like state, not in a vision, not in some kind of spiritual sense that I can't communicate to you, but in a real, physical, human sense that we all experience and share because we all have human bodies, and God made it that way. We've heard him with our ears. Our eardrums have resonated with the sound waves that his voice made. We've seen him with our eyes, our eyeballs. We looked at him, and we touched him. We think of John um, in the Gospels at the Last Supper. He re he's reclining. He's cuddling with Jesus, which is a pretty enviable position. Okay, so just to wrap it all up there, here in the first chapter of, of 1 John, John is showing us that Jesus is both eternal with God, God and man, physical. A uh, couple more points of quick review. The adjective quick is being used loosely here. We human beings are sinners. This is an important point that we've talked about the last two weeks. 
sin is real. We all sin, and it's a big deal. It says, if we say we're without sin, then we make him out to be a liar, and his truth is not in us. So combating some of the teaching that was causing confusion and distress with this group of believers, John is reminding us, Jesus came to deal with sin, and sin is a real thing. Just because uh, we have a body and this, this soul body idea, we don't just get to disconnect ourselves from our physical bodies and say that sin doesn't matter. We may be purified, however, by the blood of Jesus, as he writes, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us. So there is a remedy for that real sin that is a big deal. And then finally, to keep us balanced and to anticipate the mistakes that people often make, remember that though Jesus' blood graciously covers our sin, we are not to cheapen God's grace by indulging sin. And again, this idea of the Gnostic teaching where my faith is really a mental thing. It's sort of a Uh, an intellectual idea. It's sort of special knowledge that I have. And once I have that, then I'm kind of okay. No, we don't dismiss ourselves from the ramifications of sin and just indulge it and say, well, God's going to take care of that. Um, And as mentioned, Paul also makes the same point very clearly. Do we go on sinning that grace may increase? Surely not. Okay, that may bring us to the focus text. Let's go ahead and read 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 11 together. We know that we've come to know him if we obey his commands. The man who says, I know him, but does not do what he commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But if anyone obeys his word, God's love is truly made complete in him. This is how we know we are in him. Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you've had since the beginning. This old command is the message you've heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. Anyone who claims to be in the light, but hates his brother, is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother loves, lives in the light, and there's nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded him. I don't know about you. I like to read the alternate interpretations of what the text maybe more accurately saying, they're not sure, right? Especially in verse 5, you may have a footnote if we want to look at that briefly. But if anyone obeys God's, obeys his word, another interpretation would be love for God is truly made complete in him. Sort of shifts the emphasis there from God to us. And then in verse 10, whoever loves his brother lives in the light and there is nothing in it to make him stumble. Again, kind of, is the focus on the person or on the light? Apparently, it's not 100% clear to the translators, but. Okay. So, looking at verses 3 through 6 specifically, we can kind of see these three verses as a test. And what is the test for? Well, the test is to determine who has come to know Jesus. Right at the outset, we can imagine, perhaps you have it yourself, we can imagine people having it, some objections to a test of this nature. Couldn't we just be cool about it? Couldn't we just say, hey, you know what, if you feel that you're in Christ, then, then good for you. You probably are, sure. Um, isn't this what people find at times so frustrating and, and obnoxious about? P- 
people with strong ideals and Christianity and, and religion. There's all this kind of perpetual box checking. Do you fit the correct description? Can I have fellowship with you? Do you believe the right things? Do you do the right things or abstain from the right things? And this can be really irritating uh, in people, and we don't want to be irritating in that way. Um, certainly, we are encouraged to be careful about an attitude of continual criticism or judgment of other people. And uh, when we have ourselves to worry about, the log in the eye comes to mind as a particularly poignant example when someone else has a speck in their eye. So, so why do we need a test to determine who has come to know Jesus? I would suggest that it is, in fact, a life and death matter. If we look at, and you don't have to turn here, I can, I can find it, but you can if you want. Luke 13. Jesus is talking about the kingdom. Someone asks him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door, because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, sir, open the door for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, we ate and drank with you, and you taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, all you evildoers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves thrown out. It is not overstating it to say, that whether you have come to know Christ is, in fact, the most important thing that there is. Whether you are in Christ or not determines your eternal destiny. And Jesus says it a lot. And he says it in very stark and chilling terms. So we do want to know whether we're in Christ. It's extremely important. Why else would we want to test for this? There is much deception in the world. Certainly there sure is a lot of, there's a lot of Christian music, there's a lot of Christian entertainment, there's a lot of Christian books, there's a lot of Christian teachers, there's a lot of different ideas out there, and many of them would package themselves as being Christian. Well, a lot to sift through. Also, we get some biblical examples of where there's deception and even self-deception, where people can't really tell from the outside with absolute certainty, is this real or not? Maybe even the people themselves would say, well, I thought I was in, but maybe I'm not. We think of Jesus' parables about the wheat and the tares. Wheat and tares evidently look very similar to each other. You can't really tell them apart very well until uh, the very end of their life cycle when it's time to harvest them. The angels go to God and they say, should we pull up the tares? And he says, no, because you might pull out the good ones with the bad ones. We'll decide at the end. We'll sort it out later. Sheep and goats, right? When Jesus tells or paints us this picture of the final judgment, both the sheep and the goats, if you'll recall this, those who go to eternal reward and those who go to eternal punishment say, Lord, we never saw you. We don't really know what you're talking about when you're saying that we fed you or didn't feed you or visited you or didn't visit you. The goats are not aware necessarily, we get the impression, that they're goats. If we would have seen you, Lord, we would have treated you much better. And then, of course, Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So, there's, there's the self-protection where we want to be sure that we're taking in teaching and information from others that's in line with being in Christ, if we are in Christ. And there's also the, the need to not be self-deceived, to know whether we are in Christ or not. 
Okay, so what is the test? Uh, let's look at this text again here. Verse 3, we know we've come to know him if we obey his commands. All right, what are Jesus' commands? I feel like every part of this could be its own whole series, but we'll try to give a, a general synopsis. John 14 15, Jesus says to his disciples, if you love me, you will obey what I command. Interesting. He doesn't enumerate a list of things, but he does connect love and obedience. John 6, 29, Jesus is speaking to people, and, he's, and they ask him, uh, okay, we want that manna from heaven. We want that living water. You seem to be someone of importance. Okay, tell us what we have to do. What's the work of God? Jesus says, the work of God is this, to believe in the one that he has sent. This is one of my favorite verses in the gospel of John. I love it because it reminds us that in some sense, there is no work to be done, right? It's not, Jesus doesn't say, okay, if you're really serious, then I'll, I'll break out the real rule book for you guys. No, the work of God is this, to believe, to look at the, as he compares himself, the serpent in the wilderness that's, been, that's going to be lifted up. Believe in me. That's what you have to do. And of course, also we remember with this eclipsing thing that John tends to do, Belief is not really work. It's restful. But at the same time, we know that to believe is, in fact, very hard work at times, perhaps the hardest. What else is Jesus' command? Well, here's some from the Beatitudes. Don't lust. Don't be angry. Be humble. Be truthful. Don't take revenge. Be forgiving and merciful. Those are difficult, but those are commands. Matthew 22, 37. Oh, I don't have to look that up. It's coming. Got my little preview here. It says, love the Lord your God with all your heart. And with all your soul and with all your mind, this is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's how Jesus answered, what's the greatest commandment? Okay, so those are some of Jesus' commandments. We know that we've come to know him if we obey his commands. So there are some things that we can use to evaluate our current behavior and our current attitudes. If we are doing those things, if we are growing in those areas, if we are asking God to help us be fruitful in those areas, we are coming to know him. I want to pause for one second because I think this is a really interesting way of connecting. How do I say this? Maybe I'll just start saying it and it'll become clear. It's interesting to connect our behaviors, our struggles with sins, our struggles with attitudes, with knowing God. As we saw in those first of Jesus' commands, you love me if you do what I command. What's the greatest command? Let me go back. Love the Lord your God. If there is sin in your life, Perhaps there's a repetitive or habitual sin. Habits, patterns of sin. You probably know the cycle of alarm and repentance and then relapse into that sin. It's an unpleasant cycle. One way that might help to look at that if you're trying to break out of one of those cycles, is not, do I have enough willpower or do I dislike this thing enough that I habitually do, but do you know him? 
Do you know Jesus enough? Are you in Christ enough? Do you have an addiction? Is there something that you need to get you through the day? Something that until you have it, you can't relax? Something that fills some kind of a void in you that you feel? Do you know him? Do you know that he fills those voids? Do you have a hopeless outlook about the future? Do you know him? That he provides hope for each of us? Do you have a negative attitude? Selfishness? Joylessness? Do you have a critical spirit? Are you a fault finder? Can you always find the negative thing in any situation? It's an interesting question. Do you know him? Do you know what Christ is like? Do you know his joy? Do you know his selflessness, his supreme selflessness, beyond any selflessness that we can demonstrate? Perhaps knowing him is an antidote to some of these things that we struggle with so much. Okay, moving on to verses 7 and 8. He says, Dear friends, I'm not writing you a new command, but an old one, which you have had since the beginning. This old command is the message you've heard. Yet I am writing you a new command. Its truth is seen in him and you, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. For me, sometimes John is a little circular. And that's, I think, one of his chief merits and one of his chief demerits as far as me understanding exactly what he means. Here's what I am taking from this. An old command since the beginning. We talked a little bit about this in Bible class today. Uh, Deuteronomy 6.4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. Well, that's a command that has been around for a really long time. A couple thousand years before Jesus repeated it as the most important command. Hosea 6.4, God speaks through Hosea and says, What can I do with you, Ephraim? What can I do with you, Judah? Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. What is this thing that God wants from his people? He wants their love. He wants their sincere love that doesn't disappear like the morning mist. He wants real love. 1 Samuel 15, 22, Samuel is speaking to Saul, who has not been obedient, but has offered sacrifices. He says, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to heed is better than the fat of rams. So what is this old command? Is, is the idea of showing our love for God by doing what he asks us to do new? Not really. It's been around. And there's a lot more examples that we could look at. Yet it is new, John says. So what's new about it? Its truth is seen in him and you, says verse 8, because the darkness is passing and the true light is already shining. 1 Corinthians 5.17, this is the memory verse my boys were working on this week. In Christ we are new creations. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. There is newness in Christ because Christ forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code. He took it away, nailing it to the cross, writes Paul in Colossians 2. In Titus, Paul writes, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. There is a newness in Christ. There is a new power in Christ. There is a new widespread call in Christ, not just for Israel, but for all men, that gives us power. Because Jesus has taken our sin and has died and has defeated death and has canceled the written code that was showing us to be lawbreakers perpetually. There is newness in that that we see in him. And as his spirit indwells us, we begin to see it in ourselves. Perhaps this is what John is saying. 
Let's take a look at the last three verses of our passage. Verses 9 through 11. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light, and there's nothing in him to make him stumble. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks around in the darkness. He does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded him. We've heard a lot about our positional situation with God. Through Christ, we are positionally pure. We are free of sin. We are seen as perfect through Jesus' covering of our sin. What do we do? What do we do now? How do we practically live this out? Well, John says you can't love God and hate your brother. Later on in the, in the book, in the letter, he'll say, God is unseen, but your brother is right there. And he says, no one can love God who he hasn't seen if he can't love his brother who he has seen that's right there. And that makes a certain amount of sense to us because, you know, how are we going to do this abstract thing with someone who we don't get to, like the Apostle John, touch and see with our eyes and hear with our ears? We should be able to to put this into practice right here in the world that we actually live in. Okay, it says that if you hate your brother, you're still in darkness. Well, what is hating your brother? I would suggest that it is not mere frustration with somebody. Because I think it would be the rare parent who said, I'm really frustrated with my children, and therefore I don't love them anymore. It's not something that parents do. It's the rare coach who says, I'm really frustrated with my team right now. I hate my team. They might say it hyperbolically, but they wouldn't mean it. Of course, some of the frustration that we experience in human relationships comes because we actually care about the human being that we're in relationship with. So I don't think it's mere frustration. And I think mere frustration is something that is kind of inevitable in all of our dealings from time to time. I don't even think it's anger at sin in somebody else's life or its effects in either their life or our life. Again, if you know and love somebody, you want what is good for them, not what is bad for them. And when you see a sin in their life that hurts them, hurts their family, hurts their future, hurts their relationship with God, anger at that I think is reasonable. I believe that there's righteous anger at wrongdoing and the way that it causes ripples of darkness in other people's lives as well. So if it's not that, if it's not frustration or even anger at sin, what is it? I would suggest, and this is sort of my take on this, I'm not presenting it as gospel, but dismissing a person as different in fundamental kind from yourself. I would never think that. I would never do that. I would never identify that way. I would never treat somebody that way. I would never, I mean, maybe I would do this over here. I can kind of understand this over here, but I cannot even understand how someone could do X, Y, or Z. I can't even... I have no connection with that. I would say that if we have some categories like that of people, maybe it's an undefined group of people, but it's kind of them over there who do those things or think those things, then I would say we're placing people in a category that are different from ourselves in some way that's really not very honest. Placing a person beyond Christ's ministry of seeking and saving the lost. Of course, that's what Jesus came to do. That's what Jesus did for us, not because of our own merits, but because he loves us. And so when we place a person kind of outside of that scope and go, I wash my hands of that situation, there's, I, I can't, I give up. I think that's getting close to what hating your brother is like. And I think it probably starts with frustration, and I think it probably grows with anger at sin, and then it kind of 
morphs into these situations that are really unhealthy for us. Because, of course, we need to remember that there is no particular hierarchy of sin. All sin is offensive to God. And so when we place people in categories and say, that's one that God can't reach, or that's one that I'm not interested in reaching, that might be getting close to hating our brother. Uh, How else can we show it? this uh, sort of practical acting out of this positional reality that we have in Christ. How do we show that we know him? Well, we forgive, okay? So not placing people in categories beyond forgiveness, but forgiving like Jesus. As Peter famously asks Jesus in Matthew 18, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother? And Jesus says, a lot of times. And he tells the story of the unforgiving servant, right? The unforgiving servant, uh, the servant receives his whole debt cancellation, right? Uh, Millions of dollars or some unpayable sum, and the master forgives him. And then he goes out and finds the guy who owes him a couple hundred bucks, and he chokes him, and he throws him in prison. And God is disgusted by that kind of behavior. It grieves other people in that story. It grieves other servants when they see people being unforgiving in that way. And it grieves the master And that's not the way that God treats us. So if we know Christ, we have to forgive like Christ. Here's a good passage. If you want to know what it means to love your brother rather than hate your brother. This is from Paul, of course, in 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It's not proud. It's not rude. It's not self-seeking not easily angered, keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. There's that that idea in there, in that passage of no one is beyond hope. No one is beyond our perseverance. Someone that we're angry with, someone that we're worried about, someone that we want to reach, that we're frustrated with, Keep bringing that person up to God. Jesus loves them and is going after them. Again, verse 11 says, Whoever hates his brothers in darkness and walks around in the darkness, he does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded him. There is a possible self-deception that I mentioned before and that we ought not dismiss ourselves. Remember in John 8, as people are speaking with Jesus, he's confronting them with the fact that they are, in fact, not pleasing to God in the way that they think they are. They say, we're Abraham's descendants. And of course, famously, John the Baptist says, God can raise up descendants for Abraham out of stones. He doesn't need your lineage. He doesn't need your bloodline. He doesn't need your cultural identity. Isaiah 29, and this is quoted in the New Testament as well. These people come near me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship, their worship of me is made up only of rules taught by men. So we need to return to this test for ourselves at times to ensure that we're not deceiving ourselves depending on our Identity, depending on our past, depending on our affiliations, depending on just words, but that we really are loving people the way that Christ loves us. That's how we show that we are in Christ. What is the remedy? The remedy to being self-deceived, to not being in Christ, is God's word. Who is Christ? Remember? and abiding in Christ the vine, as he teaches us, and fellowship with the body of Christ. Those are the things that we ought to do to help ourselves to be in Christ. Acts 2.42, remember, it describes the fellowship of early believers. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayer. That's a pretty good list of things that we can do to help ourselves to remain in Christ. Remember this, 
Because this stuff is hard, and we're not going to do it perfectly. In fact, we're for sure going to do it imperfectly. Remember verse 1 of chapter 2. We have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. So, we will fail, but we go to Christ, and Christ has taken care of it, and that's a beautiful thing to remember, and I hope that you do. Let us remain in Christ. He says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Let your focus be on remaining in Christ, asking him to work through you to love others as Christ loves us.